Well, hello, and good evening. It's seven o'clock, in the UK at least. I don't know what time it is everywhere else, but uh, this is Nick, creator of Hayes Reviews, and we are here for part 10 of our reading of Lusitania by Colin Simpson, a book from 1972, a book which is small and slight. It's a little paperback, but it is really carrying a powerful message and gives us a good example of investigate investigative writing. It shows us that headlines and these bite-sized news stories that we get given to us, whether through social media or Twitter or tabloid newspapers or these kind of places, that a book can communicate so much more and tell us so much more and is pretty much always going to be a better source of knowledge and information about any given topic. So, we're finishing up this book tonight. We've got three chapters left. It's about 40 pages or so. And so I think we're going to be here for the next maybe 90 minutes to two hours. So if you can hear me loud and clear, please let me know. Good evening. How's it going out there? I have changed some of the audio settings a little bit so that I don't have to have the microphone so close to my face and I'm not moving it around all the time and, and messing with it. So in theory... I should sound good and audible. I shouldn't have to move the microphone around like I usually do, fidgeting and, and all that, so it won't be as distracting. And I'm hoping that the um, when I read and when I look into the camera and talk, it'll it'll all sound reasonably good. The trade-off might be that, that there could be some more background noise getting picked up by the mic, pages turning and, and clicks on the mouse and that sort of thing. But just let me know. What do you think? Is this is this set up better or is it better when with when I have it the previous way and I'm moving the damn thing around all the time? <laughs> it does give me something to, to do with my hands when I'm speaking and if I'm feeling a bit nervous or kind of conscious that I'm broadcasting out to people, it gives me some fidgety thing to do, which which can be nice. It could be a good it could be a good way to to kind of uh, relax yourself sometimes. But anyway, let me know about that uh, if if this one if this setting and, and setup is working and sounding good. Good evening, Peter and Richard. Very good to have you here. And uh, you're saying that audio and visual is good. Fantastic. Thank you for that feedback. I appreciate it very much. And so, yes, we're going to be finishing up the Lusitania tonight. And uh, it's been a it's been my longest read so far. This is this has been a ten part series. Every video is an hour and a half, if not slightly longer. Um, so it's taken us a while to get through this. And and you know it's it's quite a thin little paperback. <laughs> But we've also explored some of the context and added in some of the sources, which are on previous videos, articles, and websites that, that flesh out the story and give us some more artifacts to consider and to look at, because it's quite an in-depth um, story. There's a lot of characters involved, and it seems like even to this day, the picture and of what exactly happened is still kind of murky and gray. Uh, I was looking earlier on Amazon and I was trying to find other books that deal with this topic. And there's a, there's a few that caught my attention. Um, I don't know if I'll rush out to buy them. But there's quite a few books out there. There's one that's more recent than this that was published in the 80s. And then there's another one published in the 90s. Now, the question is, have those books got new information, new sources included in them? Or are they rehashing the same sort of material as Colin Simpson is? Or are they even leaving some stuff out and trying to rewrite the story and obscure some of the information that Colin was putting out there? It's hard to say. And without a kind of rigorous academic study side by side of all the books, it is it is tricky to know. But I do think that it's often better to get older books and often better to get first editions where possible. And then I just prefer the hardbacks because uh, they're just a, they're a little more... Uh, fun, you know, tactile to hold and they last a little bit longer. They're easier to pack and look after and protect and preserve. So in the case of Lusitania, it's it's connected some really big names in history, Churchill, uh, J.P. Morgan, Colonel House and President Wilson, uh, the four sort of big players and names that come to mind. And then oh, we've also got the... Um, who was it? Well, who was the famous wealthy man who died, and uh, and and he he his his wife was widowed, and I forget his last name now. Somebody in the chat might be able to shout it out. Um, one of these wealthy families with a lot of influence and power. Um, so there was a 
So he was on board when it went down and he, and he didn't survive. And then apart from that, a lot of the people that we're dealing with in the uh, narrative and in the story, it's not really a story, but the, the, the account of what happened there, the sailors and the staff who worked on the ship or who worked for the Admiralty, uh, and then the last couple of chapters, we've been going through the the inquest into the event. Uh, and so it's it's a lot of moving parts to consider. And you've got to remember the context of the time. That's very important to to um, to remind ourselves of that it was World War one one was underway. The allies were not doing particularly well and they needed really in order to win the war and to turn the tables on the Germans, they really needed America to come in on their side. And just exactly how this happened is is really one of the cr crucial parts of the story that I think is so critical and why this book is, is very important to read. The other thing that I like to say about why this book's important to read is because it gives us a very clear um, example of how the public are treated when events such of this magnitude are rolled out. Now you can bet that this, when when this happened, this this picture here on the cover, and the um, the coverage of the event itself was probably broadcast all over the place, relentlessly, over and over and over again to traumatize the population and to get them whipped up into a frenzy so that they would go along with having, uh, the, I'm talking about the American public here, so they, so that they would go along with having their country dragged into a war that they didn't want to be part of that was against the um, home nation of a th which a third of the population in America uh, hailed from ancestrally. Uh, so it, it when these events happen, one one aspect of it is to traumatize people. Think about the September eleventh, uh, two thousand and one event. How many times they played the video and the footage over and over and over and over again. And I believe a similar thing occurred back in uh, the sixties. Was it when um, JFK was assassinated? Uh, we were just watching my wife and I um, um, the series Mad Men recently, and that covers the time when when the assassination took place and everything in the office stops and they're all watching it and they're all traumatized. And there's that saying that you can remember where you were when that happened. So we get shown these events and they happen over and we get shown them over and over and over again. And it's it's kind of a way to, to traumatize people, to get you emotional, to get you out of your calm, rational, logical uh, analysis of, of the evidence that's being presented and into a more reactive state, a more kind of uh, reptile brain limbic system um, reactive state, because then you're easier to control. And so a lot of what happens in the world, a lot of our news and mainstream media and world events and the way it's presented to us and told to us is done deliberately to, to, to get us in a reactive emotional state uh, because there's when we're when we're calm, when we're relaxed, and we're thinking clearly, and we can analyze things logically. Uh, we are much harder to control. We are much more likely to point things out and to realize when we're being scammed or when we're being lied to, or when um, something doesn't add up or doesn't make sense. But if they can, uh, but if we can be tricked into an emotional response, then that shuts down the logical analysis and uh, gets people riled up and clamoring for all sorts of crazy things to happen. And that is the kind of problem reaction solution that we hear about quite often in these sort of circles who research these kind of things. Um, it's, it's, uh, and, so, and so this book, I think, is revealing to us that the narrative that was pushed wholesale at the time of the event was completely, completely um, inaccurate and was not a full account of the picture uh, we've we've seen in the last chapter that the investigation was really a farce there was testimonies that were not included first hand survivors who who made it off the boat and made it to shore they wrote down their accounts of what happened and that wasn't included and there were refusals to question and hear the uh, testimony and the input of, of experts and people who had worked on the boat and knew about the designs. There was uh, a lot of sh a kind of um, tomfoolery going on with the cargo manifests, for example. And it very much seemed that the, the purpose of this 
was not the public were not led into um the the true full import of this event and i think that is the case and and and, and it's so important to read these kind of books because then we can see well if in the past they lied to the public about such an important event and we now know that because of all the all the records and the information that they locked up and filed away and classified for 50 years is now available to us if they did that in the past why wouldn't they do it nowadays nowadays when it's when it's even easier to distract people to bombard them with nonsense not to mention the fact that you can get deep fake for images and uh, audio and, and even video now. It's very, very hard to tell in this day and age whether something we're hearing or seeing with our own eyes is is real or true when it's on a screen. You know, and I, I hope uh, that nobody out there thinks I'm an AI sort of program. <laughs> I was thinking about this with regards to the channel and, and what I'm trying to do here. And, and I, was, I thought it might be good to get a, a sort of a, a no AI used kind of um, stamp or logo or, you know, like you have for organic food or you, you might have for, for something that's made in a certain country, you know, just a kind of like no AI used in the production of anything on this channel. <laughs> because I think it's a very soulless uh, and dangerous technology and we become reliant on it at our own peril because the more we use it the 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 more we lose our own abilities to do these things whether it's be creative or um you know type the, the best thing it's for that we can be used for is probably to to write more software because it can do the coding thing very quickly but um i think uh the point i'm trying to make is that even back in over 100 years ago they had they had a much easier time of lying to people. Nowadays, we've got not only uh, lies to figure out, but we're also being bombarded with just made up stuff, irrelevant stuff, uh, things that don't think like entertainment, distractions, um, gossipy kind of sensationalist headlines, uh, all sorts of just irrelevant nonsense, which which we can kind of describe as noise, you know and what we're trying to do here, what I'm trying to do and what other people, I think um, the best content creators and, and sort of people in the truth movement try to do is to provide a signal in that noise where we can communicate something that's actually real and tangible and reflects reality and isn't a distraction and is empowering and useful knowledge. So I think we're getting that in this book because we're seeing how public uh, perception is manipulated and the public are misled uh, in order to serve the agendas of people who are very far removed from the public, live a totally different kind of life and do not care about the public and are very happy to just send hundreds of millions of people off into war to have into hell basically and in, in, the they'll, they'll, war is hell on earth and they'll they'll happily send people off into those kinds of situations um to die to kill and to die to murder and it's sickening and the only way it is done the only way it continues to happen is because of the ignorance of the general population and the immorality and the willingness to be deceived and it's because of this um, unwillingness to take a step back and to really inform and educate uh, and, and critically analyze everything. Inform and educate ourselves and critically, critically analyze everything around us. Uh, and so I think I've really enjoyed this book and I think it's been a useful one to get on the record. And it's very, and I don't think this book contains everything we need to know about this this uh, subject and this this time and, and this event, right? But it's a fantastic introduction and it certainly leaves a lot of questions uh, still remaining and to be answered. But anyway, that's my little preamble. So now that I've done that for 15 minutes, hopefully we've got a few people on the stream. Let's have a look in the chat. Okay. Uh, Hasdak is here. Good evening. All, and then Pete is saying all of these instances are intentional. Yeah. I think so. It seems that way. It seems very scripted. And we've talked before with regards to this book about lie hop, let it happen on purpose, or, or my hop, make it happen on purpose. I think a lot of these things are planned out and scripted way ahead of time. Um, and just the, the, because the, it would have to be unfathomable amount of catastrophic coincidences for these things to happen 
spontaneously and unplanned, right? I don't really believe in accidents anymore and I don't really believe in coincidences anymore uh, since tumbling down the rabbit hole back in 2020 and uh, <laughs> and starting to learn about these kind of events and these kind of situations. So yeah, coincidence theorist, no, that is not me. But that seems to be a lot of people these days and I think part of the problem is they don't read books. So I'm trying to do what I can to help take away their excuses and you can't read it, maybe you can uh, stick on a video and listen to it. So, I've got Elizabeth Kendall as well. Good evening. Welcome. Nice to have you here. And uh, with that little intro done, let's go over to the book, Cal, and crack on. So we've got seventeen chapters 17, 18, and 19 to get through. And uh, let's see. And then there's some acknowledgments at the end, and then you're into like the notes... Uh, and the sources and the index. So as I've said before, it's always fantastic when a book provides notes, sources and index and a bibliography. It just shows that they're a little more uh, rigorous in what they're trying to tell you and they're not just expecting you to believe them. Uh, they're giving you the option to go and check it out and verify for yourself. And it's this idea of, uh, to me, all the best content creators and all the best documentary filmmakers and teachers of our time, they always provide you with the references. They give you the sources underneath and they say, this is what I think about them. Maybe I'm wrong. What do you think about them? Read them for yourself and make your own mind up. And, and that's really the empowering um, way of doing this rather than just telling you what to think and what to believe and what to do. It's more about empowering you to go out and read these things and make your own mind up and decide for yourself because I think it's very it's just a very it's just the kind of mature adult grown up thing to do isn't it so let's crack on with chapter 17 hopefully the audio's good let me know if uh if it needs turning up or anything like that might be able to crank it up a little bit here let's see okay 17 the marical incident obviously disturbed lord mersey it had occurred after he had closed the inquiry and the final stages had brought him brought home to him that the Lusitania case was not so clear-cut as his earlier briefings and Captain Webb's memoranda had made it out to be. He considered only the bare minimum of evidence to satisfy his terms of reference from the Board of Trade. Some of the points obviously worried him when he considered his report. For example, whether the Lusitania was armed or not. The evidence against rested on one question to Captain Turner. Was she armed or unarmed? unarmed. Alfred Booth, the Board of Trade Inspectors and the Design Engineer all escaped such inquiry. The much-published claim that many portholes were open received equally short shrift. First Officer Jones testified that he was in the dining saloon when the torpedo struck. If any had been open, he claimed, they would have been closed as he had ordered it. The transcript shows how futile a remark this was. Mr. Cotter, representing the stewards' union, had asked him, Cotter, but it would be dangerous for the ship's safety if the ports were open, if you took a list to the starboard side, would it not? Jones, naturally. Cotter, did you go up the main companionway from the saloon? Jones, yes. Cotter, did you see any of the passengers going up that way? Jones, well, when we were struck... There were about 100 people lunching in the saloon. And the moment she was struck, of course, we all got up and they preceded me out through both doors. I was about the last man to come out of the saloon. It was as I was passing through the door that I issued this order, close the ports. It would be academic to speculate who was there to carry out his order. And presumably the 29 passengers' proofs which stated the saloon ports were open, were omitted by the Board of Trade for this reason. No other evidence was presented on the question of the portholes. So that actually is sort of implying that the portholes were opened deliberately in order to let in water faster to get that sinking uh, done quicker. And if you've seen the previous videos, you'll know eight, this ship sank in 18 minutes, which uh, was really fast. This seems to be a suspicious uh, aspect of how that happened. Uh, and especially if they've, there's people saying they were open and then there's one guy saying they were shut and he gave orders to, to shut them. It's very fishy. 
The Attorney General had dictated the torpedo's point of impact in his opening address when he stated that she was struck between the third and fourth funnels. There is evidence that there was a second and perhaps a third torpedo fired. The body of evidence to confirm this statement is a trifle confused. Seven witnesses referred to the impact point. Between them, they declared, Near number five boat, number two funnel. Forward of number two funnel. Forward of number one boiler room ahead of number one funnel. Number one funnel. Between numbers two and three funnels and the second one just under number three funnel, as far as I could judge from forward. I saw the wake between two, number two and number three funnels. A big volume of smoke and steam came up between the third and fourth funnels. 72 depositions or proofs which stated that the torpedo struck beside the bridge or close to it were not called in evidence. Three crew members who did not see the impact testified that as the ship was sinking, they saw the tracks of more torpedoes. Each man saw a different track coming from a different direction. This evidence was sufficient for Lord Mersey to find that the Lusitania was struck on the starboard side somewhere between the third and fourth funnels. A second torpedo was fired immediately afterwards, which also struck the ship on the starboard side. Lord Mersey added that there was evidence that a further torpedo was fired which went to show that perhaps more than one submarine was taking part in the attack. His findings did not mention or account for the fact that the Lusitania sank by the bow. The debacle of the port side boats had scarcely received a mention. Leslie Morton, aged 18, who appeared to have found the time to observe and subsequently gave evidence on almost every point at issue, testified that when he went to the port boats, there were no passengers there, that the boats were all empty, and that no one was lowering them as it was obviously impossible to do so. Two passengers claimed that they saw a port boat spilled into the water owing to the davits breaking or the falls jamming while a third stated that she got into a port boat but left it when asked to do so by Staff Captain Anderson. Possibly there was a distinct shortage of persons left alive from the port side to testify as to what had happened. Third Officer Bestick was called, but his answers were carefully muted. He mentioned that he had tried to push out one boat which had swung inboard. He did not mention any accident to any boat, nor was he asked. The final question in his examination on this subject, which lasted just over a minute, was, did any boats for which you were responsible get away? Not to my knowledge. First Officer Jones unconsciously summed up the attitude of the inquiry to the port boats when he was asked in cross-examination by Cotter. Cotter, had you been over to the port side at all? Jones, yes. Cotter, what did you see then with regard to the boats? Jones, I do not remember a thing about the port side, so you might as well leave that out. <laughs> He's on a ship that's sinking and uh, yeah, just, nope, nothing. Don't remember anything about that. This is such a, this is such a joke, this whole investigation, isn't it? Curiously, the only open criticism of the handling of the boats came on the first day during Captain Turner's brief appearance in public when he answered almost every question in monosyllables. Obviously, he was feeling the pressure upon him. But just once, his natural outspokenness got the better of him. Cotter asked him, Was the crew of the Lusitania proficient in handling boats in your estimation? Turner replied with some emphasis, No, they were not. Cunard's counsel, Butler Aspinall, rose to his feet and with the silent acquiescence of the court carried out what must rank as a classical exercise in the art of re-examination. Aspinall, you told the gentleman who sits behind me that in your view the crew of the Lusitania were not proficient in handling boats. Turner made no reply. Aspinall, I want you to explain that a little. Is it your view that the modern ships, with their greasers and their stewards and their firemen, sometimes do not carry the old-fashioned sailor that you knew of in the days of your youth? Turner, that is the idea. Aspinall, that is what you have in your mind. Turner, that is it. Aspinall, you are an old-fashioned sailor man? Turner, that's right. Aspinall, and you prefer the man of your youth? Turner, yes, and I prefer him yet. Wisely seeing the captain was beginning to seethe again, Aspinall changed the subject. 
No further evidence was called as to the efficiency or proficiency of the boat crews, but there is little question that many of the passengers present or of those who had made formal proofs had their doubts. Both the Attorney General and Solicitor General wisely decided to limit the number of passengers to be called. F.E. Smith hinted this as broadly as possible to Lord Mersey, with the bland insolence for which he is chiefly remembered and which infuriated many of the judges before whom he appeared. Quote, My Lord, with regard to the other passengers, the Board of Trade has a large number of statements made by passengers both of the first, second and third classes. I have read, I think, all those statements, and I am bound to tell your lordship that they involve, in my judgment, a very great deal of repetition, and they do not develop specific complaints as far as my recollection of them goes. I find myself in some little doubt as to how far I can usefully assist the court. His emphasis on the last three words was sufficient for the shorthand writer heavily to underline them. But Lord Mersey was slow to take the point and began to speak at a tangent. Smith interposed that, quote, The most convenient course would be if your lordship would give me an opportunity before tomorrow morning of discussing the whole of the remaining balance of this evidence with the Attorney General. Mersey was still slow on the uptake. Does that mean you want us to rise now? It is ten minutes to four, my lord. Then it does mean that you want to rise. The Solicitor General descended into sarcasm. No, my lord, there is nothing that I should like better than to go on taking evidence if it will amuse your lordship to hear passengers called. Lord Mersey eventually got the message. Then we will rise now. Captain Turner gave very little evidence in open court. Apart from his brief outburst about the boat cruise on the first day, he had spoken almost entirely in monosyllables, and counsel had not probed into anything more interesting than his age, the type of certificate he held, and whether or not the U-20 had given a warning before she fired her torpedo. He was present, however, throughout the opening hearings, sitting behind Aspinall in lonely isolation. Alfred Booth confided to his cousin that poor Turner clings to Aspinall for support. He appears demused by the affair. Yeah, I thought that was supposed to say bemused there. <laughs> Turner was more than bemused. He was miserably unhappy. A whispering campaign had started in Liverpool and London that he was the cause of the disaster. Some militant female had handed him a white feather as he entered Central Hall on the first day of the hearing, and his wife gave him no support. Oh, I feel bad for this guy. In fact, he never spoke to her again after the hearing. Whatever the original reasons for the breach, the disaster made it permanent. Captain, go on, Captain Turner's getting a real rough deal here. The loneliness he must have felt, together with his domestic problems and the after effects of losing his ship and spending four and a half hours in the water when just past his 60th birthday, made him a disconsolate figure and probably clouded his judgment when he stepped into the box for his in-camera testimony. Facing him were two of the most brilliant lawyers in England, and a judge who by his acerbity had already demonstrated that he was not prepared to give any witness an easy passage. In Turner's case, Lord Mersey had also been instructed to, pre to prejudge the issue. Turner was to owe his survival from this ordeal to his counsel, Butler Aspinall, and to Lord Mersey's belated but profound respect for English law, which surfaced dramatically towards the close of the hearing. Before the inquiry had commenced, Turner had been interviewed by solicitors for the Board of Trade and by someone at the Admiralty. Captain Webb's allegations had been explained to him, and he had been told that he had never been instructed to divert to Queenstown. He was handed a list of what purported to be all messages that, he, that had been sent to him. The vital signal was not there. His papers and the logs had gone down with the ship, and he was later to tell Miss Every it was all so confusing, like a bad dream. He was not legally represented at any of the preliminary proceedings, and when he had realised that Coke's signal was not available to his defence, he had decided to say that the reason for coming in closer to the shore was to establish his correct position so that he could slide through the opening into St. George's Channel without danger. He added that in order to do this, he would have come into the mouth of the channel close to the land and not in mid-channel as he had been ordered. 
Aspinall had formulated the defence that this was a proper course to take in view of the signal sent to Turner, stating that the last known position of the U-boat was 20 miles south of the Conningbeg lightship that marked the entrance. 20 miles south was exactly mid-channel. It was a flimsy defence, but without the existence of Coke's signal, it was the only possible one. I suppose as well, back in the day, it was, it was pretty convenient that you know you could sink a ship and all that evidence just gets wiped out <laughs> with it, doesn't it? Kind of like if you want to blow up some buildings, a lot of the evidence in there gets taken out and that does a lot of your work for you. Turner had argued that the wireless operators would confirm the receipt of the signal, even if they did not know the code. There had been two wireless men aboard and both survived. David McCormick, who had received the messages, was ignored and his colleague Robert Leith was called. Leith had been on duty from 2am until 8am and was due to relieve McCormick again at 2pm. When the torpedo struck, he was having a meal after spending the morning in his bunk. He was slightly late in relieving the watch, but this was because at noon that day, the, English, the Irish-English time differential of 25 minutes had been adjusted on the ship's clocks and the two operators had agreed to split the difference between them. Irish-English time differential of 25 minutes. I'd never heard of that before. So, it, well, I, I, I guess England used to be 25 minutes ahead or Ireland used to be 25 minutes ahead or something. The calling of Leith instead of McCormick was grossly unfair to Turner as Leith had no knowledge of what messages had come into the wireless room during McCormick's watch. The wireless log had gone down with the ship. Leith was examined by Sir Edward Carson, who led his witness into confirming the facts that the Admiralty wanted in evidence. There had been three coded messages to Turner, one from Coke at 11.02am and two from the Admiralty timed at 11.52am and 1pm. Sir Edward wanted only two. Carson, on Friday morning the 7th, did you receive two government messages? Leith, yes. Carson, which were from a wireless coast station? Leith, Leith, yes. Carson, the first was about 11.30. Leith, approximately. Carson, and the other one shortly after one o'clock? Leith, yes. Carson, to the court. There is no dispute if your lordship remembers the evidence. I only want just to confirm it. Sir Edward's phrase, if your lordship remembers the evidence, can only refer to Captain Webb's memorandum or some other private briefing before the case, as this was the first time the signals had been introduced into evidence. Leith was not asked any further questions on them by anyone present. Turner was then cross-examined on his actions. Carson, first of all, took him through the various advisory memoranda alleged to have been given to him by the Admiralty. Earlier, Alfred Booth had testified that all Admiralty advices went direct from the senior naval officer Liverpool to the captain. The SNL had refused to confirm this, but was not called to refute it in order. In court, Turner told the court that the only advices or instructions that he had had in England came to him from Cunard. Aspinall did not cross-examine on this issue, but if Turner did not receive any vital advice or instruction, it is relevant that he would have been the Cunard Company's omission, not his own. However, Turner was asked in the case of every instruction except the zigzag advice issued on 16th of April if he had received it on a certain date. On all of these, he confirmed that he had, and that he had been given them by Cunard. Sir Edward came to the zigzag instruction but did not specify its date or ask him if he had received it. Instead, he asked, Did you read that? Turner replied, I did. If the accusation is made that this account seems directed at exonerating Turner, it must be conceded that there is a most unlikely chance that he could have done so. Turner himself was convinced that he had read some such instruction and there was one issue on the 10th of February 1915 which urged masters on sighting a U-boat to take evasive action and ram if possible, if a submarine was sighted. The evasive actions suggested were sharp alterations, of course. His admission that he had read the zigzag instruction brought the Attorney General's attempt at a knockout. Did you not, do you not see now that you really disobeyed a very important instruction? Turner made no reply. Later, 
Butler Aspinall intervened. Aspinall, you received that instruction. Turner, yes. Aspinall, and you know of it? Turner, yes, I know of it. Aspinall, now, what did you understand that to mean? Turner, I understood it to mean that if I saw a submarine to get clear out of its way. Aspinall, if you saw a submarine. Turner, if one was in sight. Aspinall, if one was in sight, you understood then that you were to zigzag. Turner, yes. Aspinall, you may be wrong. Turner, I may be wrong. I certainly understood it that way. Aspinall, what has caused you to alter your view? Turner, because it has been read over to me again, it seems different language. Aspinall was to return to the question of the zigzagging later on in his closing speech, and he tried to introduce the earlier advice for evading submarines into evidence. But Sir Frederick Inglefield intervened, and his use of words certainly let slip the true role of the Lusitania when he held that the 10th of February advice was irrelevant, as, quote, that order applies more specially to the early operations of these cruisers, end quote. Lord Mersey must have taken the point because on his judgment notes in his transcript, he has ringed the word cruisers and marked it with both an exclamation and a question mark. Turner was asked why he had not travelled faster by putting all available men onto the boilers and refiring number four room so that he would have arrived at the Mersey bar some hours before the tide would permit him to cross it. He replied that it would have been dangerous because he knew submarines were operating in those waters. Lord Mersey, possibly scenting some truth in Captain Webb's allegations, interrupted. I am not satisfied about this. When, from whom did you get the information? Turner replied it was general knowledge, and though he could not remember how he heard it, he certainly did know about submarines having been active. Mersey sarcastically asked him, It is not twelve months ago that you heard it, I suppose. Turner, not recognising the innuendo, of pre-war knowledge of German operations, replied mildly, no, it was not that long. Mersey spoke to the court in general. You see, these answers are worth, no are worth nothing when you test them. They are not worth much anyway. Mersey's sarcasm did once at least arouse Turner. Sir Edward Carson had challenged the master on his course and asked why he had come so close to the Irish coast. Turner replied, to get a fix. Mersey interrupted. Do you mean to say you had no idea where you were? Yes, I had an approximate idea, but I wanted to be sure. Why? Turner replied with what must have been the dignity of a sorely tired, tried man. Well, my lord, I do not navigate a ship on guesswork. Again, it was left to Butler Aspinall quietly to point out that the mid-channel instructions refer specifically to the English Channel and St. George's Channel and the entrance to the latter was almost a hundred miles away from Kinsale. Turner's riposte must have brought home to Lord Mersey that he was, after all, conducting a court of law. Turner withdrew during the recess, and Mersey invited Aspinall to comment on the captain's evidence so far. Aspinall prefaced his comments by saying, What I want to emphasise is this, that the captain was, undoubtedly, a bad witness, although he may have be a very excellent navigator. No, said Mersey. He was not a bad witness. Aspinall. Well, he was confused, my lord. Mersey. In my opinion, at present, he may have been a bad master during that voyage, but I think he was telling the truth. Aspinall. Yes. Mersey. And I think he is a truthful witness. I think he means to tell the truth. In that sense, he did not make a bad witness. Aspinall. I was going to submit that he was an honest man. Mersey, I think he is, and I do not think Sir Edward Carson or Sir Frederick Smith have suggested anything to the contrary. The impression the man has made upon me is, here, Mersey hesitated and started again. I came here prepared to consider his evidence very carefully, but the impression he has made upon me is that he was quite straight and honest. Aspinall summed up for Turner as best he could. He concentrated on the precautions he had taken and marked out his route on the chart. He emphasised that the captain had carried out all instructions. He conceded that he had not zigzagged and attempted to bring in the previous advice on what to do when a submarine was sighted. But Inglefield finessed this so firmly that Aspinall remarked, Yes, 
I think one may neglect that. He did, however, pour scorn on the suggestion that Turner should have stood out to sea without a landfall and entered the channel by night. Without calling evidence, he managed to gain Mersey's acceptance that safety came before Admiralty advices to mariners. Lastly, he produced for the court a devastating list of the ships which had been attacked or sunk within the previous six weeks along the route Captain Turner had to take. And this point erased Lord Mersey's reservations that Turner had improper knowledge of German activities. F. E. Smith rose to make the closing address for the Board of Trade. Sensing Mersey's changed attitude, he began by saying that of course it was not his function to conduct a prosecution, but that he felt his case would produce some considerations which might or might not lead to an opposite conclusion to that on behalf of which Mr. Aspinall has contended. The Solicitor General concentrated on the series of signals sent to the Lusitania, and here Captain Webb's staff Captain Webb's staff work let him down. The dialogue between Smith and Mersey must be reproduced verbatim, from which it becomes apparent that Webb, not content with exonerating the Admiralty, had prepared a further case against the captain and Cunard, but had decided for some reason or other not to present it. Unfortunately, he had handed Lord Mersey one memorandum, which has survived in the Mersey papers, and given a different one to the Solicitor General. Unknowingly, F. E. Smith began to read from his version, Smith. On the 7th of May, a period when, of course, the Lusitania's attention had been in the most pointed way directed to the fact that the general submarine menace had materialized at the particular point south of Ireland, on the 7th of May they received a message. Submarine area should be avoided by keeping well off the land. Mersey, which... Mersey, which telegram are you referring to? Smith. The one on the 7th of May, my lord. Mersey. To whom? Smith. To all British merchant vessels. Mersey. Where is it referred to in the evidence? Smith. I will give your lordship the reference. Mersey. Are you reading from the Admiralty Memorandum? Smith. Yes, my lord. Mersey. Would you tell me where it is? Smith. If your lordship will, lordship will look, it has been ascertained that the following wireless message passed. It is towards the end of the page. On the 6th of May, the 7th of May, and the 8th of May. Mersey. Are you reading from the memorandum headed Lusitania? Smith. Yes, headed Lusitania, my lord. Mersey handed his copy of Webb's memorandum down and said, Where is it? F. E. Smith compared his version with Lord Mersey's. It is very curious, my lord. I cannot explain it at all. Your lordship's copy is not the same as mine. Oddly enough, I have a different document to the one your lordship has. Mersey. What is the document that you have got? Smith. Mine, my lord, is an admiralty memorandum prepared by the officials of the Board of Admiralty and headed Lusitania. Mersey. Could you find me any reference to it in the evidence, Mr. Aspinall? Aspinall. No, my lord. It is new. Smith. I've been working on it throughout the case. That's very curious. Somebody messed up. Lord Mersey reached across and took a bundle of Admiral Inglefield's papers. These included the master copy of the log of the Valentia wireless station. He compared both versions of the web memorandum with the Valentia log and then summoned Sir Ellis Cunliffe, the solicitor to the Board of Trade, up to the bench. He handed him all three documents and asked which was correct. Sir Ellis replied that Inglefield's, the master copy, was correct. Lord Mersey coldly asked, what is the meaning of it, Sir Ellis? Do you know? Sir Ellis lamely replied that the only explanation that he could think of was that the web memorandum was phrased as it was in the event of it being thought that this might have been heard in open court. Smith lapsed into his familiar acidity. I must confess I do not want it. I think it would be very unfair for me when it has not been put to the master and had not been produced in evidence to found any further comment upon it. Smith's point was that he had asked Turner if this was the list of signals he had received, to which the captain had meekly replied yes. From Inglefield's master copy of the log, it was plain there had been a message which had not been entered in evidence. This was Coke's coded signal at 11.02am. It was immediately obvious to Mersey that he was being misled. Furthermore, 
the master copy did not contain the signal about keeping well off the land, which had been entered in evidence and which a confused Turner had admitted he had received. Mersey kept any opinions he may have formed to himself, but he also kept Sir Frederick Inglefield's master copy and other papers. In his personal judgment notes, he states that he found it difficult to understand why Inglefield had not called his attention to it before, as it must have been apparent to him from the beginning. This episode seemed to take most of the steam out of F.E. Smith's closing address. When he had finished, Mersey spoke to the assembled council. He was now troubled in his mind by the Board of Trade's phrasing of the questions which comprised his term of reference. Mersey. Now I should like to ask a question. I shall have to deal with this point, and having regard to the form of the questions, I suppose the form has been carefully considered. It is possible for us to give a very short answer. Were any instructions received by the master of the Lusitania from the owners or the Admiralty before or during the voyage from New York as to the navigation or management of the vessel on the voyage in question? You will observe, Mr. Solicitor, that that does not ask, and what instructions? Therefore, that question can be answered by yes or no. Then, did the master carry out such instructions? Well, that question can be answered yes or no. And I should like to know whether you think it wise that we should attempt to answer in detail. I will tell you what is running in my head. If we blame the master, there is an appeal from our decision, and that appeal cannot be properly heard, at least I think not, if we give a judgment which gives no reasons. I am talking about this particular voyage, of course, and I am not sure that it is desirable to give reasons. I mean in the public interest. I can conceive that the appeal might be heard in camera and that the reasons that we might give that we give might never be heard of by the public, but the larger the audience to which these observations are made, the greater the risk. And I should like to know from you whether, as representing the Board of Trade, who propound these questions and put these questions before us, what kind of answers you really wish us to convey. I fancy, I do not know, because I saw a previous draft of the questions, and then I saw this draft of the questions, and this draft of the questions departed from the previous draft in this way, that the previous draft asked what were the instructions, and this draft does not. And as this was the final draft, I came to the conclusion that those advising the Board of Trade had purposely abstained from asking what the instructions were. Smith, that was so, my lord. Mersey, very well. Then, of course, if I understand that that is so, I should probably not attempt to refer to the instructions and should confine myself to a simple answer, yes or no. Smith, yes. Mersey, then comes the next question, which I think is answered by the way you have answered the first question, because if we are to go into details in answering the question, did the master carry out such instructions, it would almost be impossible to avoid saying what the instructions were. Smith, is your lordship quite right in saying, I have not considered the point before, that an appeal would be in any way hampered by the fact that these questions had not been answered with greater fullness than your lordship contemplates? Mersey, all I can say is that if the matter comes on appeal before a tribunal, according to my notion, it is very desirable that the tribunal should know what the reasons were which guided the tribunal below. Smith, of course, I agree respectfully with your lordship, but I think there would be no difficulty. At least, I should assume that there, were, there would be inherent powers in the court of hearing it in camera there. Mersey, I assume so. I never heard of such a thing as taking an inquiry of this kind in camera until this case. Smith. It is possible that the difficulty which your lordship indicates, that the court will not have any, fuller, any fully detailed reasons for these answers, might be met by asking you in more detail what your reasons were if that point arose. Mersey. It might be, and I could tell them by word of mouth. Smith. Yes. Mersey. Very well then I think that would be the most convenient course. Now I shall not close this inquiry case in case we should want any further evidence or in case we should want any further assistance from counsel. I simply now adjourn it. Scene die. Scene die. 
When the court had been cleared, Lord Mersey invited his, ans his assessors to submit to him in writing their views as to whether or not the master of the Lusitania was in any way to blame for the disaster. He asked them to do so independently and to hand them to him in a sealed envelope. Among the four, only Inglefeld, only Inglefield felt Turner was to blame. He gave us his opinion that Turner should have headed out to sea and zigzagged about until nightfall and suggested that the court returned a censure such as indicated by Captain Webb. Mersey disagreed, so Inglefield went behind his back to Sir William Graham Green, the secretary to the Admiralty. Sir William obviously did some pretty rapid canvassing for him on the 1st of July 1915. For, our, for sorry. Sir William obviously did some pretty rapid canvassing for on the 1st of July 1915, he wrote formally to Lord Mersey, informing him that though Captain Webb's original memorandum had been written for his guidance, it did not necessarily reflect the current opinion of the Board of Admiralty. He continued. By the first Lord's wish, I have conferred with Sir Arthur Nich Nicholson at the Foreign Office, and he has now written to me to state that in the opinion of the Foreign Office, which includes that of Lord Crewe, there would be no objection to the publication of a censure upon the master of the vessel on the lines of the last paragraph, but one of Captain Webb's memorandum, vis-à-vis, -vis, that the master received suitable written instructions which he omitted to follow, and that he was also fully informed of the presence of hostile submarines in the vicinity of the place in which he was torpedoed. Mr. Balfour agrees with Lord Crewe in this matter and desires me to inform you accordingly. If you should still have any doubts on the subject, Mr. Balfour would be glad to see you at some convenient time. Graham Greene now had a new board of admiralty. On the 15th of May, Fisher had formally resigned and retreated to Sulk in Scotland. He had been emotionally and physically exhausted and disagreed profoundly with Churchill. He also feared being made the joint scapegoat for the Dardanelles in Broglio, from which England was trying to extract herself. The Shell Crisis had led to the formation of a coalition government, and the Conservatives' price for cooperation was that Churchill be dismissed and sent into the political wilderness. A.J. Balfour had become First Lord of the Admiralty. Heads were beginning to roll at the Admiralty, and it is unlikely that Mr. Balfour would have been fully briefed by Captain Webb. So is this the same Balfour as who lent, loaned his name to the Balfour Agreement? I'm, um, I'm feeling like it probably is. Mersey made his report on the 17th of July. With new leaders at the Admiralty, he decided to follow his conscience as far as Turner was concerned, but as a whole, his verdict assisted the government. He castigated Maracle, found that all the portholes had been closed, and that there had been no explosion of anything except at least two torpedoes. In the case of Turner, he produced a masterly compromise. Quote, Captain Turner was fully advised as to the means which in the view of the Admiralty were best calculated to avert the perils he was likely to encounter. And in considering the question whether he is to blame for the catastrophe in which his voyage ended, I have to bear this circumstance in mind. It is certain that in some respects Captain Turner did not follow the advice given to him. It may be, though I seriously doubt it, that he had done so his ship would have reached Liverpool that that had he done so his ship would have reached Liverpool in safety. Yeah, so he's saying even if he did follow the advice, it probably wouldn't have made a difference. So he's trying to do what he can to not let Captain Turner be the fall guy. But the question remains, was his conduct the conduct of a negligent or of an incompetent man? On this question, I have sought the guidance of my assessors who have rendered me invaluable assistance. And the conclusion at which I have arrived is that blame ought not to be imputed to the captain. The advice given to him, although meant for his most serious and careful consideration, was not intended to deprive him of the right to exercise his skilled judgment in the difficult questions that might arise from time to time in the navigation of his ship. His omission to follow the advice in all respects cannot fairly be attributed either to negligence or incompetence. He exercised his judgment for the best, it was the judgment of a skilled and experienced man, and although others might have acted differently and perhaps more successfully, he ought not, in my opinion, to be blamed. The whole blame 
for the cruel destruction of life in this catastrophe must rest solely with those who plotted and with those who committed the crime. Lord Mersey was equally positive on another matter. Two days after delivering his judgment, he formally wrote to Prime Minister Asquith, waiving his fee for the case, and adding that, I must request that henceforth I be excused from administering His Majesty's justice. He was more forthright to his children. The Lusitania case, he told them, was a damned dirty business. Ooh. A damned dirty business from, uh, from the judge in the case. How about that? One second, let me just clear my throat. Take a sip. So I hope the audio was good there. Um, so it seems like Fisher at least did have some sort of conscience and, and uh, seemed like he wasn't in. You know, if 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 this whole is it incident was a, a, a lie hop scenario and, and kind of planned and orchestrated deliberately, it sounds like Fisher wasn't in on it. Uh, although that and that's probably why they had to really fluff up the evidence and the witnesses and the whole case and the investigation. Um, it sounds like they're really, and it, it actually reminded me of two things that are going on at the moment, you know, in the present day, we just recently had the whole trial of Sam Melia, which, um, let me just see if I can pull that up quickly. Sam Melia UK. So for people who don't know, Sam Melia created the uh, White Rose stickers and he created these back when lockdowns were happening. And these were stickers that you could download for free and print out and then stick them on, on things. And um, the stickers said a variety of things and he's been taken to court. He was actually arrested by the counterterrorism unit. They barged in and jumped on him and arrested him, I think at work or, or somewhere public. And then they, they, they've they taken him to court. It's been three years. On, this thing's been ongoing. And they've found him guilty. And they've put him down for two years. And the charge is that he made these stickers with the intention to stir up racial hatred, racial, racial violence. Now, in the court case, they admitted, the prosecution admitted that the stickers themselves were, everything written on them was true. And they also admitted that the stickers did not break any law and, and are totally lawful and legal. But it was his intention to stir up some sort of racial violence, which, which uh, he, he's been held, which, be, which he's been given a two-year uh, prison sentence for. And in the court proceedings, they went on to his uh, devices, his digital electronic devices, laptop, phone, and whatnot, and they pulled information from his private conversations, including uh, apps like Telegram, and they flashed these up in the court and used these to kind of assassinate his character uh, in order to sway the jury so that they would come down with a guilty verdict and and just a, a real gross injustice and a real scary sign of where we're at, uh, particularly here in the UK. There was another clip that was going around, which was Constantin Kissin. He's the presenter of the Trigonometry podcast. And there's a clip of him in 2018. And he's saying, do you know how many people have been arrested in Russia for saying something online? And the guy he's talking to says, no, how many? And Constantin says, 400 wow, 400 people have been arrested for saying things online. And then he says, do you know how many people have been arrested in England for posting things online? And the number's something like 3,000 or 4,000, some, some you know orders of magnitude bigger than, than the number arrested in Russia. And that was back in 2018. So that was before the great scam of 2020, before the lockdowns and questioning injections and calling out the absurdity of what was going on. Uh, was causing people also to get arrested. So that's the second thing. This whole incident kind of reminded me of just how we've got this facade of, of law and this facade of a, of a justice system, but it's really there 
it, it doesn't function properly. It's not actually holding criminals to account. It's not actually getting to the root and the real people who are who are responsible. Uh, it's it's actually used, I think, as a uh, to protect the people who are truly responsible and to get people out of the way who are figuring things out and who are calling out the cons and the scams and the lies and the deceits and all these sorts of things, which, which reminds me of the other uh, case, which is Richard D. Hall. And um, Richard D. Hall runs a website called richplanet.net. And he's been, uh, he, he's been doing his thing for quite a long time here in the UK. And he's just an investigative journalist himself. And he talks to experts and authors and he carries out his own investigations and he's having his name and reputation dragged through the mud. He's being lied about on national television. He is being slandered by the BBC and all his uh, rebuttals and his evidence is freely available on his website for anybody to go and look at and check out. But I watched an update about his court case recently and he prepared this big document full of his evidence because the, the the he's being called in for um, for his investigation into the Manchester Arena incident, and he's found some artifacts and, and some anomalies in the evidence and the story and things that don't add up through his own investigations, and now he's being targeted and forced to go through this lengthy, ridiculous court proceedings, which is very expensive. And he produced, produced this document, which he has, uh, I forget how many pages, but multiple hundreds of pages. And that was just uh, dismissed. The, 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 the judge just decided not to look at it at all. So these, this, this justice system that we have is, is, you know, even back then, even back when this was happening, you, we just read that Fisher... Fisher retired off the back of it. He, he, he obviously saw that he was being lied to. He was being misled. He was not being given the full set of evidence and facts. And there was no way to make an informed decision to carry out a proper judgment and, and, and a, a, a verdict according to what was right and moral and correct and true. He, he just he didn't have a chance and he saw that. So good on him for resigning and saying he didn't want any more um, involvement in that. So... Pretty powerful stuff. Let's uh, have a quick look at the comments before we crack on. Gwen's here. Good evening, Gwen. How are you doing? Hope you're doing very well. Peter is saying, just like the money trail leading to Saudi Arabia and supposedly the September 11 commission, the Warren Commission, textbook examples of the fix. Yes, and I have here, which we might do on this channel one one day at some point, I have... Uh, Edward J. Epstein's inquest, which is one of the original exposés about how commissions are commissions. You know, when when the criminals investigate themselves, what do you expect is going to happen? <laughs> but this guy, this guy was a roommate of G, um, not G. O. Griffin of John Taylor Gatto, who wrote the Underground History of American Education, and this uh, and he and this book is actually. Uh, one of the reasons that the term conspiracy theorist was created uh, by, was it the FBI or the CIA? One of those two. They created the term conspiracy theorist. They said, this guy, Edward J. Epstein, he's written this book, Inquest, and he's got people calling out how the Warren Commission is full of holes and, and not uh, not done properly and is obviously a, a whitewash. So we're going to we're going to deploy this this phrase conspiracy theorist and we're going to encourage people and tell people to use that against anyone who is asking questions anyone who is trying to dig up the truth and trying to sniff around and find out what's actually going on and so that is a there's a specific memorandum Richard Grove knows the the name of that memorandum by heart but I I don't know it but there's a specific memorandum saying use the term conspiracy theorist to discredit, to, um, to get, and, and, it, and now, and that's what it is now. It's just a way for people, whenever they use it, whenever someone uses that phrase, they're just saying, I'm unwilling to look at the evidence and I'm going to dismiss it. That's what they're actually saying. And, and, but you know, that whole, I'm unwilling to look at the evidence and I, and, and I'm going to dismiss it is, is the true meaning of the words conspiracy theory or conspiracy theorist. <laughs> but yeah, so the Warren, the Warren Commission, at some point, we should get around to reading that. Uh, I haven't read that one yet, 
Let's see. This is 1966. So even older than this Lusitania one we're, we're going through now. So yeah, got lots of good books on the horizon to look at and read. But anyway, yeah, Peter is saying they're being assanged. <laughs> it's unfortunate that that could be used as a verb, isn't it? LJ Bates, good evening. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, Peter says thought crime, two years for thought, thought crime. Yeah, and that guy is, I think there's a give, send, go for him, if I'm not mistaken. Give, send, go, Sam Melia, or one of these fundraising type uh, efforts. Maybe it's not that, maybe it's a different thing. Sam Melia. He does have one somewhere. Mark Collette set it up. Oh, it is give some go. I got it. Right, I'm going to chuck this in the chat just for anyone who wants to throw a few pounds his way because he has a pregnant wife and a young daughter. And I mean young daughter as in, as in sort of toddler age. And he's been put down for two years for creating lawful stickers, which are legal and factually correct and accurate. Uh, because of his intention. And not only did the court admit that they, the stickers were true and lawful, the court, the, uh, Sam himself, with every download of stickers, he put um, a message on there saying, use these lawfully or don't use them. So he was telling people, do not break the law, do not stick them on private property, you know, put them in places where there's loads of stickers. And we all know, we walk around town, the city centers, there's places where stickers get put up and they stay up forever. They never get taken down. They never get scraped off, right? You got all sorts of different brandalism, <laughs> you know, these, these flyers and things posted to various places in the cities. So he couldn't have done, he couldn't have been any more rigorous and thorough in covering himself. In, in making sure he was abiding by the law. All he was doing was basically sticking up for the native population of the country and trying to get a political conversation going about what is happening with regards to immigrants and, and people coming in and the numbers and the demographics and the tensions and all these kind of challenges that occur and rise out of that. He was trying to get a conversation going and that is re the real reason why he's been sent out for two years. So gross miscarriage um, of, of, of injustice there, I would say. And Rich Planet, um, I don't know if there's any... I think for him, the best thing is to just go to his uh, website because then you can just get the uh, updates and the evidence from him. He also has a Telegram. He has a Telegram group. Maybe that's the best thing for me to share here, if I can copy his telegram group link that's going into the chat so if you have a you know if you we're reading about this kangaroo court here uh back 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 way back when these, these things are still happening today and that's the whole point of having this historical context so that we don't just be ignorant and say well the justice system is obviously on our side and doing the right thing and sam Mealy is a bad person and rich plant rich uh, rich d hall is a bad person no 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 these people, you got to look at, you gotta, don't dismiss it. Look at their evidence, look at their arguments and look at what's being done to them and how their evidence is being not even, not even looked at by the, the people who are supposedly responsible for meeting out justice. Um, and, and just as a side note as well, one of my favorite things was, is that in America, they have the criminal justice system. And think about that phrase for a second. It's criminal justice. It's, it's justice for criminals, you know? So they actually tell you over there what it actually is. <laughs> the criminals get the justice and the innocent people uh, get shafted as usual. Anyway, let's not get bitter. Let's carry on with the book. Um, we've still got two chapters to go and we're, we're over an hour in already. So let's crack on. Adamski is here. Hello, sir. Hope you're doing well. Welcome back. Okay. Chapter 18. The State Department greeted Lord Mersey's verdict with undisguised relief. Now, you only feel undisguised relief if, <laughs> if you're guilty and you thought you were going to get caught. Each post had brought further allegations and accusations from militant pro-German Americans that the Lusitania had been an armed auxiliary carrying munitions. 
Secretary Lansing, in every case except one, merely acknowledged them, but took no further action. Gustav Stahl's foolish affidavit had appeared in the New York Times, and the administration's countermeasures had been as swift as they were unconstitutional. In his affidavit, Stahl had justified his presence aboard the Lusitania by saying that he had helped his friend Leach to carry his trunk aboard. Special Agent Bilaski had found the trunk in Stahl's lodgings. This was the only flaw in Stahl's story. The chief steward of the Lusitania confirmed that Leach had claimed to have lost his boarding pass and had been granted another, so Stahl could easily have gained access. His description of the mounting blocks of the gun, its canvas cover and its hiding place matched the now known facts precisely. The truth is probably that when the photographic party failed to return, Stahl was a hasty substitute but he was not of sufficient mental calibre to sustain his role, and three months in the tombs would not have stiffened his resolve. Most of the other letters Lansing received were either well-meaning or the work of German propaganda organisations. However, one was from a lady whose family to this day forbid her name to be mentioned, possibly because one of them, in due course, became a President of the United States. Her original letter is amongst Lansing's private papers, which are open to scholars, but not necessarily available for publication. The gist of her letter and its provenance deserve attention. She claimed that she had recently been in London and had gone to tea with Clementine Churchill. Lord Fisher had looked in. While he was there, he had a cup of tea and the lady asked him to help her get a priority passage back to New York. Fisher told her to be sure that she travelled either on the Lusitania or the Olympic, as both carried a concealed armament. Wow, Fisher said that. He offered to and did arrange her passage, which because of her date of travel was on the Olympic. She saw no guns, so explained to her steward what Lord Fisher had told her. The steward, realising her connections, showed her how the decks could be lifted to reveal the gun rings and confided that it would take about 20 minutes to wheel the guns into position. The letter asked that President Wilson be informed of these facts so that it would guide him in any decision he might take. Lastly, it was stressed that it was not for publication. The Mersey verdict was announced on the 17th of July but the British cabinet had been informed on the 10th of July. Sir Cecil Spring Rice in Washington was told on the 11th, and he informed Lansing in a handwritten demi semi official note the same day. Lansing then turned over to the Treasury and the Attorney General an explosive pile of papers, which had been sent to him by the Austrian ambassador Constantin Dumba three weeks previously, but on which his department had taken no action. The Treasury replied that they also proposed to take no action themselves and would leave the matter to the Attorney General's department. Some action was taken, but despite my determined inquiry, no formal record is yet available to the public. Some of Lansing's other papers leave sufficient clues precisely to identify the allegations and to postulate what happened. These papers of Lansing's were declassified by the American government in April 1962. They have never been published. On the 22nd of June 1915, Constantine Dumba wrote to Lansing a personal and confidential letter from his country house in Lenox, Massachusetts. My dear Mr. Lansing, I beg to send, you, to send to you directly an official note accompanied by an English translation referring to information about the sending of explosives on the Lusitania. I take at the same time the liberty to enclose the English translation of the correspondence between my embassy the Austro-Hungarian consul in Cleveland, and Mr. Ritter, a chemist, whose affidavit seems to be important enough to justify a thorough investigation by the federal authorities. I wish to explain my point of view in this affair in order to avoid all misunderstandings and should lay particular stress upon absolutely excluding the press and the reporters from all proceedings and even keeping them in entire ignorance of my step. We don't assume any responsibility for the person or the veracity and trustworthiness of Mr. Ritter, who is a highly nervous man, although a clever chemist and full of resources. We don't incriminate anybody, neither the British military attaché nor the Cunard line. 
We simply put at the disposal of the State Department information which seems interesting and the nature of which can easily be controlled. The embassy will be certainly attacked and slandered by some of the pro-ally papers if anything should leak out and be published about my note. I therefore have the honour to ask you kindly to consider and treat my step and correspondence as strictly confidential and to ensure me against unpleasant press attacks. With many thanks and kindest regards, believe me, my dear Mr. Lansing, yours very sincerely, C. Dumber. The enclosed correspondence concerned Ritter von Rettig's actions after his conversations with Captain Gaunt about the susceptibility of pyroxylin to seawater and his reading in the American press the eyewitness accounts of the Lusitania's second explosion. He had mentioned this to the Austrian consul in Cleveland, who conducted through an eminent firm of local attorneys, Messrs. Reed, Eichelberg, Eckelberger, and Nord, an extraordinarily deep investigation. Members of the DuPont shipping and packing gangs were interviewed, and copies taken of the shipping documents and carriage notes of the barge companies in New York, also of the records of the New York, Philadelphia and Norfolk Railway and the Pennsylvania Railway. It transpired that several hundred tons of pyroxylin had been sent to the Lusitania, as well as to certain other steamers loaded for England. The one error in the allegations was that the consignment notes named Robert Fitzgerald as paymaster to the Lusitania, when in fact Fitzgerald was the name of the traffic manager of G.K. Sheldon and Company, the Admiralty agent on the Cunard dock. The pyroxylin was packed and sewn most unusually in burlap matting and was shipped in packages weighing between 35 and 40 pounds. The relationship to the unexplained 3,813... 3, whoa, hang on. 40 pound packet. Yeah. The relationship to the unexplained 3,813 40 pound packages of cheese is obvious. Finally, Dumba's enclosures included details of shipments about to be made with the names of the steamers on which the pyroxylin was to sail. There was also a short postscript saying that Ritter von Rettig, in the opinion of one of the embassy staff, was not quite normal. The State Department ordered Malone to send them the manifests of the steamers mentioned by Ritter and his informants, which confirmed that part of the allegations, Special Agent Barberini was ordered to check the carriage records of the railway companies, and he also confirmed that such consignments had been made. These preliminary inquiries were organised by the Office of the Second Assistant Secretary of State, and the results were sent to the Assistant Secretary, Mr. Addy, with the following notes. Mr. Addy, this seems to be important. Has the Secchi, Lansing, seen it? Shouldn't it also be sent confidentially to the Atty General? I guess that's Attorney General. Addy agreed, and he passed the material to Lansing, writing on the docket. Dear Lansing, I have always had my doubts about the $150,000 shipment of furs by the Lusitania. The Secretary of State did nothing for two weeks and then sent copies of the complete file to the Attorney General. From that point, there is a gap in the archives. Guesses at the action taken can be hazarded from fragments of information. On the 18th of July, the Cleveland Austri Austrian consulate was burgled by unknown persons and Ritter's papers were stolen. On the 24th of July, Ritter was arrested for check offences, and though he pleaded that he had never signed the checks in question, nor even seen them, he was held in custody. On the 2nd of August, he appeared in court charged with utterances prejudicial to the peace of the nation under Section 5 of the Federal Criminal Code. The trial was in camera. He was convicted and sentenced to one to three years. He claimed that he had been framed, but there is no evidence available on which to examine his defence. The State Department records contain tantalising glimpses that this was no simple case of petty fraud. There are a small group of coded telegrams in the National Archives identifying two witnesses in the Ritter case as a member of the Treasury Department's Secret Service and a special agent of the Department of Justice. Lastly, there is a coded telegram from the Attorney General instructing the Cleveland Attorney General on no account to release any information concerning Ritter to the press and not to proceed until a full report and instructions came from Washington. Perhaps Lansing was honouring Ambassador Dumba's request for privacy. 
The Ritter affair was a narrow squeak for the administration. The exact location of the truth still lies buried somewhere in the archives of the Department of Justice, and it is significant that the relevant file is still classified secret. Researching into and writing of these events long after leaves one with a taste of despairing cynicism. But among the tangled threads of the US reaction to the disaster, there is one magnificent piece of classic American opportunism which deserves a place, if only, to lighten the narrative. A newsreel team had filmed the Lusitania's departure, and the film belonged to Morris Spires, the owner of the Spires Theatre Realty Co. Company of Philadelphia. On the 14th of June, 1915, he approached Mr. Powell, the British consul in that city, and not only told him he had the negative of the film, but hinted that a man with a foreign accent had tried to buy it from him, because the picture gives a very clear view of the decks. Powell reported immediately to the embassy in, L in Washington, who in turn sent an urgent cipher signal to London. The price of the film was $150 for a print or $15,000 for the negative. The Admiralty signaled back authorising the consul to purchase the film and negative forthwith. Fortunately, Captain Gaunt had the sense to view it first and was able to assure London that there were no guns. Spires missed his chance of $15,000 and the lack of guns only goes to show that the Admiralty did not want the negative for its sentimental value. The political dialogue over the Lusitania continued throughout the autumn and into the winter. The German Foreign Office remained remarkably stubborn and it was only the conciliatory manner of their ambassador in Washington, Count Bernstoff, that prevented a break in diplomatic relations. Lansing himself favoured a break and possibly so did Wilson. Unfortunately, in August and September, the British mystery ship Barillon committed two separate atrocities that severely shook Wilson's and Lansing's pro-ally stance. On the 19th of August, the U-27 stopped the British cargo steamer Nicosian and gave the crew, which included eight US citizens, time to escape before attempting to sink her with gunfire. Meanwhile, another vessel came alongside flying the American flag and with a board fixed to her sides with the stars and stripes painted on it. It was the Barillon. She opened fire on the U-27, which speedily sank. The survivors climbed aboard the damaged Nicosian, or stayed treading water with their hands up. After picking up the Nicosian's crew, the crew of the Barillon shot every survivor from the U-27. The captain of the U-boat leapt overboard from the deck of the Nicosian when he saw what was happening and was shot by rifle fire. It was only the protest of the Nicosian's American crew members to the State Department that made the affair public. The Barillon repeated this performance on the 24th of September upon the U-41 after she had stopped the steamer Urbino. The first lieutenant of the Urbino, Lieutenant Crompton, reported the captain of the Barillon to the Admiralty and his report came immediately after a stiff note from Lansing about the U-27 incident. The Admiralty categorically denied both charges and awarded the Barillon's captain, later drowned off Scapa Flow, an immediate D DSC. Lansing voiced the admi administration's doubts in a cipher signal to Ambassador Page on the 18th of October 1915, when he asked him to obtain full and complete information to determine whether, if these reports are true, it is not incumbent upon this government to change its lenient attitude toward the arming of merchant vessels. In this mood, he began to drift, draft an almost complete reversal of his policy, whilst at the same time he maintained constant pressure on Germany to settle the Lusitania question. He accepted the German argument that in view of the invention of the submarine, it was impractical for a merchantman to carry any form of armament if the cruiser rules were to be observed. He tested this thesis out on Wilson, who approved it. Here, then, was the nub of a settlement to the Lusitania dispute. Germany would admit liability, and America would press the Allies into disarming all merchant ships and revising their orders so that they would automatically submit to a submarine's challenge. Two factors stood in the way of this formula. The first was the temper of Congress. The British blockade was causing delays to mails, cables and cargoes. Valuable commercial information was being extracted by the censors and passed on to British firms. Cargoes were often impounded for weeks at a time and frequently confiscated. In the latter case, Britain eventually paid full compensation, 
But in the meantime, American businessmen were losing both money and markets. So, so Britain's just confiscating their, their stuff and keeping it. The resentment found its outlet in Congress and Lansing realized that once he achieved the settlement over the Lusitania, Congress would demand that he take an equally firm line with the British authorities. President Wilson was standing for re-election in 1916. His attitude over the Lusitania had already alienated the German vote. He could not afford to make any more political enemies. Lansing informed the president that though he was now in a position to conclude a settlement with Germany, such an action would lead to grave political disadvantages as the anger of Congress is going to centre on England. The Germans had in fact submitted a note which would effectively close the matter. One sec. Just need to cough. Let me mute. There we go. The second reason why America did not want a settlement just yet was that Colonel House and Wilson had evolved a plan whereby America was to enter the war on the Allied side. The plan depended on Britain's and France's agreement, and America needed to have some causes belli to justify intervention. House urged Lansing to delay the Lusitania case while he held secret negotiations with French Premier Briand and Sir Edward Grey. Unfortunately, and without House's knowledge, Lansing had circulated the Allied ambassadors with an unofficial memorandum outlining his new policy for the disarming of all merchant ships. This had gone out on the 18th of January 1916. House learned this in London on the 24th of January and cabled the president in no uncertain terms that such an action would irretrievably wreck their plan. Lansing had to turn a diplomatic somersault. To help him do so, Wilson explained the House plan to him. America was going to propose a conference to end the war. The Allies would accept, and if Germany did not, then America would join the Allies. If Germany did accept, America would dictate terms agreeable to the Allies. If Germany did not accept these terms, America would declare war. Neither Wilson nor House had any mandate from the people or Congress for such an action. In the absence of this mandate, the United States had to keep up the show of a dispute over the Lusitania so as to keep her options open. Not only was the peace of Europe at stake, so was Wilson's re-election. For both great causes, Lansing had to wreck the Lusitania settlement. So they had a solution that seemed agreeable and probably would have worked for both sides, but because Colonel House and President Wilson had a plan and uh, you know their handlers and schemers and co-conspirators, uh, because they had a plan, Lansing's solution was scuppered. And he had to do a, what was it, a diplomatic somersault. Lansing devised a Machiavellian solution. From, Ber from Berlin, Ambassador Gerard advised him that the Germans suspected that there was a secret agreement between America and the Allies. If this was true, it would give added impetus in Germany to the public and naval demands for a resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare. On the 26th of January, Lansing invited Baron Zwiedeneck the Austrian charge d'affaires, to call on him. He showed him in confidence the circular about the disarming of merchantmen and intimated that the baron was free to tip off his government. Zvidanek confided in return that there was increasing pressure to resume unrestricted submarine warfare unless the Allies disarmed their merchant ships and suggested that perhaps between them they could both disarm Allied ships and avoid the horrors of attack without warning. Lansing fanned the Baron's enthusiasm by offering to let him use American diplomatic channels to get his message home, as London was delaying the cables. Zwiedeneck wrote his dispatch, which he handed to Lansing together with an English translation. Lansing read it and accepted it. It included the sentence, Mr. Lansing would welcome an announcement from the Central Powers that they would henceforth treat merchantmen armed with one gun or more as auxiliary cruisers. The response was prompt. Germany and Austria announced that as from 8th of February 1916, they would do just that. The public uproar with which this announcement was received throughout the United States completely puzzled the Central Powers. Lansing had tricked the Baron, 
and fostered the second period of unrestricted submarine warfare. He had kept Americans' options open and given her the grounds for repudiating the agreed settlement over the Lusitania. Ah, oh. well, landing Machiavellian. Good. That's uh, that's uh, that's some crafty. Uh, <laughs> That's some crafty work right there. On the 16th of February, Wilson wrote to him confirming that this was the course to be followed. I have no hesitation in saying that but for the recent announcement by the Central Powers as to the treatment, they propose subjecting armed merchantmen and those which they presume to be armed. It would clearly be our duty to accept the German note as satisfactory. Lansing admitted the trick long after the war. But at the time, he made extraordinary efforts to make it seem like another Dumba incident, but this time with the Baron Zvidanek in the role of Brian. The same day as Lansing read the Baron's cable, he wrote a minute for his archive saying, call attention of Austrian charge if opportunity offers to his use of the word welcome. I did not use this word, but said, if the German and the Austrian governments intended to issue such a proclamation, then the sooner they do it, the better. Lansing could have stopped the cable, advised the Baron promptly, or telegraphed a negating or corrective instruction to the American ambassadors in Berlin and Vienna. Instead, he waited until the Central Powers, having taken the rope he had given them, publicly hanged themselves. He then formally repudiated the secretly agreed Lusitania settlement, thereby showing all America that Wilson's administration was firm and unyielding after all, and that President Wilson was the man who deserved their vote in the forthcoming election. Bolstered by confidence, Colonel House initialed the secret agreement with Sir Edward Grey on the 22nd of February. Sir Edward had previously made a memorandum for the benefit of his cabinet colleagues, and the phraseology is interesting. Colonel House told me that President Wilson was ready on hearing from France and England that the moment was opportune to propose that a conference should be summoned to put an end to the war. Should the Allies accept this proposal, and should Germany refuse it, the United States would probably enter the war against Germany. Colonel House expressed the opinion that if such a conference met, it would secure peace on terms not unfavourable to the Allies, and if it failed to secure peace, the United States would leave the conference as, as a belligerent on the, on the side of the Allies. And there's a footnote here which says, when President Wilson saw the draft, he inserted the word probably in this space. Uh, so would probably leave the conference as a belligerent on the side of the Allies. What House and Wilson did not realise was that neither Britain nor France had any intention of allowing America to take a peace, and peace initiative. If eventually in, in, intervention was needed, they felt, the America, they felt that America should enter the war on the same terms as the Allies and not under any moral obligation. The house Grey agreement was useful only to the extent that if its contents were leaked, America's integrity as an honest broker would be hopelessly compromised. It was a splendid insurance that the United States would, come, would continue to supply the tools and the credit whilst the Allies would finish the job. Give me a second, I'm just going to cough. So, I, I like that we're getting to see some of the uh, Colonel House and Wilson and Lansing and the fact that there was this plan to get America in. Uh, at any cost, really. And this is what's happening at the higher levels. These games are being played, these Machiavellian strategies and tactics are being utilized. And then meanwhile, the the common folk, the Joes and the Janes, uh, are getting murdered and killed and going off to war and traumatized. It's pretty sick. But very illuminating to learn about it, see the evidence, and remind ourselves when the war drums are being beat in the present day that there's probably a lot of Machiavellian nonsense going on higher up the pyramid. And we need to cause uh, pause and take a moment to, to consider, okay, what is actually going on? Are we being told the truth? They weren't being told the truth in the past. Can we really trust them to tell us the truth in the present? <laughs> 
So doesn't look like we've got too much in the comments. So I think that means let's crack on with the final chapter. So this is it. We made it to the final chapter, chapter 19. The diplomatic impasse engineered by Lansing hindered the numerous claims for compensation filed by the survivors and dependents of those who had lost their lives. The State Department took the view that any attempt to prejudge the matter in the civil courts would prejudice America's negotiating position. For this reason, they refused to release any information whatsoever to the numerous firms of attorneys engaged. Several of the claimants had given detailed statements to Constable Frost in Queenstown, but had not retained copies for their own use. Their applications for a sight of their own statements met with a remarkable degree of evasion. On the 9th of September 1915, Messrs. Hunt, Hill and Betts, the New York attorneys for Mrs. Gertrude Adams, whose husband had been drowned and whose son's affidavit had already been quoted, applied for a copy of the son's statement. The State Department referred them to the Treasury, which in turn referred them to the Attorney General. From here, they were advised to contact Consul Frost direct, and when they did so, he advised them that they should put their request to the State Department, who predictably sent them a duplicate of their previous reply, referring the inquiry to the Treasury. Hunt, Hill and Betts never obtained Adams' affidavit and eventually asked him to make another. By this time, he was serving with the American Army and the military authorities refused to allow him to testify without State Department clearance, which was not forthcoming until March 1918. Nevertheless, 94 claimants represented by 13 law firms continued to press their claims, which totaled slightly over $5 million. Whew. Each alleged negligence by Cunard, citing the design, stability, open portholes, davits, and navigation. Okay, hang on, let me reread that. Each alleged negligence by Cunard, citing the design, stability, open portholes, davits, and navigation. Five specifically alleged that the Lusitania was carrying contraband and munitions of war. Can Canadian and other military personnel and that she was an auxiliary of the Royal Navy. Dudley Field Malone was joined as a co-defender with the company on these claims on the grounds that he should not have issued a clearance certificate. Should any one of the allegations be proved, Malone would automatically be indicted for involuntary manslaughter. The potential legal embarrassments were as dangerous as the political. Cunard, faced with the multiplicity of claims, took the same defensive action as had the White Star Line after the loss of the Titanic. They presented a petition before the, United, the New York courts to limit their liability. Yeah, now, liability, that's an important one, isn't it? And very pertinent to what we've been seeing over the last four, four years and the experimental medical procedures that have been rolled out and how liability has been um, just non-existent for the companies and corporations that made those products. If this plea if this plea was accepted by the court, it would have the effect of all the several actions against them being heard at the same time. An American judge, once he had agreed to allow Cunard to present such a plea, would hear all the evidence of all the claimants and his decision would be binding upon everyone. Should he find for Cunard, their liability would be limited to the value of the wreck strippings and salvage recovered, together with the monies received for passenger fares and cargo freight less the costs of forwarding the shipwrecked passengers from Kinsale to Liverpool. Should negligence be proved against the company, damages would be limited to whatever amount had been paid into court at the time the plea and limitation had been presented. Only if the claimants could prove that Cunard had broken the law or were privy to the disaster could the damages be higher than the sum paid into court. <clears throat> Cunard solicitors, Hill Dixon and Co Dickinson and Company of Liverpool, instructed Lord Day and Lord of New York to enter a plea and limitation on their behalf and pay $100,000 into court. On the 23rd of June 1916, in order to sustain this action, Hill Dickinson wrote to the Admiralty requesting permission to exonerate their clients. They asked that all the evidence presented before Lord Mersey be made available to them together with all the instructions and written messages which the Admiralty had withheld. 
No reply was received to this request, which was repeated at monthly intervals until December of that year. On the 4th of January 1917, Hill Dickinson had to write regretfully to Lord Day and Lord That. We have been quite unable to obtain any answer from the Admiralty regarding our application as to what particulars may be furnished to you for the purposes of the proceedings in your country. And we are afraid that in the absence of instructions we cannot supply you with information. It will, of course, be readily appreciated that at the present time there is perhaps not much opportunity for officials of the Admiralty to deal with inquiries of this nature, but we had fully expected to be in a position to send you some definite answer long before this. Hill Dickinson shared their American legal advisor's opinion that the Admiralty's tardiness would gravely prejudice their case. America's entry into the war on the 6th of April 1917 promoted a slightly more cooperative attitude, for the Admiralty agreed that all the evidence laid before Lord Mersey in open court could be used in the American hearings. Sir William Graham Greene strengthened this evidence by writing a letter which implied that any other instructions or advices to the master which may have been given were not relevant to the navigation of the vessel and were only withheld so as not to assist the Germans. His letter, which was eventually accepted as evidence by the New York District Court, contained the falsehood that the evidence heard in open court before Lord Mersey does include all the wireless messages which were sent by or on behalf of the Admiralty to and received by the master of the Lusitania on a last voyage from New York. And of course, we read, read earlier that one of those was missing, at least one. In retrospect, Cunard's case had little on it which could be based, but Lucius Beers, the senior partner of Lord Day and Lord, strove to construct a formidable legal edifice. The state of war was also proved a godsend. Beers prevailed on all the lawyers acting for the claimants to accept that because of the war, it would be in order to take much of the evidence in London before a commissioner for oaths. At the same time, he managed to obtain agreement that all the published evidence established before Lord Mersey should be accepted in toto. This meant that Lord Mersey's findings became facts. It was not generally known that the published evidence contained very little more than the introductory speeches of Sir Edward Carson and Sir F. E. Smith, and their examinations of carefully selected members of the crew and passengers. Lucius Beers himself was aware that when the cr crunch came before the judge in New York, he would need some more witnesses, and anxiously cabled Hill Dickinson to say it was essential that Captain Turner and as many others as possible should come to New York. Hill Dickinson very wisely thought otherwise, and took a formal opinion from the redoubtable Butler Aspinall, who stated, Captain Turner will be the principal witness. Whilst referring to him, we might parenthetically deal with the point which was put to us in consultation vis-à-vis whether in the American proceedings he should be examined in England or America. We emphatically advise the former. Captain Turner is a difficult witness and wants extremely careful and delicate handling. His idiosyncrasies are known here to those who have the handling of him. They are not known to the defendant's advisers in America. And without intending any disrespect to the extremely able counsel conducting the proceedings in America, we consider that Captain Turner's evidence is likely to be more satisfactory as an article grown in England than as the product of American forensic talent. In fact, speaking generally, we think that as few witnesses as possible should be examined in America. We do not advise calling any passengers. None of them is of any real value, and passengers are usually dangerous witnesses. Yeah. N none, none of the people who were there at the time of the incident could, could possibly have anything useful to say, could they? Meanwhile, Lucius Beers wrote to Secretary Lansing asking if there were still objections to the commencement of the Lusitania proceedings and remarking that if the case was heard after the cessation of hostilities, the result might put those parties who have been instructing me at a disadvantage. On the 24th of May 1917, Lansing replied with a copy to the Department of Justice that the State Department had no objection, but that all parties must first submit their evidence to the Department of Justice in case there should prove a need to take part or all of the proceedings in camera. In London, British claimants had also filed actions against Cunard and Hill, and Hill Dickinson advised Alfred Booth, Cunard's chairman, that in counsel's opinion it would be far better to have the American case decided first, as it would be heard by a judge sitting alone 
and not by a jury. The letter continued. Subject to your approval, we therefore propose to do everything we can to delay the trial of the English actions. English actions. If you approve of counsel's advice being followed, we propose to apply to the court for an order for the for an order for the evidence of the clerks who issued the tickets to be taken on commission in America. If this order were made, it would have the effect of the English actions not being heard for several months. Excuse me. Booth approved, and this is what was done. The evidence for the American proceedings was heard in London by a commissioner sitting in the Law Society's building in Chancery Lane. No public were admitted, but otherwise the cast was almost identical to that of the Board of Trade's production. A junior executive of Cunard, Charles Cottrell, watched the proceedings. His diary has survived. Monday the 11th, June 1917. Left Liverpool by the 940 train with Mr. Peskett and Captain Turner. Met Miss, Mr. Pursehouse of Hill, Dickinson, at the Howard Hotel at 3 p.m. Went to paper buildings for consultation with counsel. Counsel went over various points in the probable evidence and questions of procedure. Mr. Aspinall decided on second thoughts not to go through the evidence with Captain Turner, as it might flurry him. It was mentioned that the commissioner appointed was a Mr. R. V. Wynne. Of the name being mentioned, both counsels said they knew him and their opinions seemed to be that he was an old woman. We then returned to the Howard Hotel, where Mr. Pursehouse of Hill Dickinson went over many of the salient points with Mr. Peskett and Captain Turner, which took until 7.15pm, Tuesday the 12th of June. Oh, sorry, which took until 7.15pm, and this is uh, the next entry. Tuesday the 12th of June. Met Hill Dickinson and company at the various witnesses at the hotel at 10.15 and proceeded to the Incorporated Law Society's Hall in Chancery Lane. The commissioner took his seat at 11 a.m. and took the oath himself and then arranged procedure with both sides, namely Messrs. Butler, Aspinall and Rayburn for the Cunard Company, Mr. Scanlon for the Americans. The shorthand writer was called and the first witness called was Mr. Peskett. Mr. Rayburn examined Mr. Peskett on the construction of the ship bulkheads, watertight doors, boats, davits, and passenger and crew capacity. Mr. Scanlon closely cross-examined him on various points, the principle being mechanical davits versus the old style. He also examined very closely on the question of the stability of the ship with compartments flooded. Mr. Peskett said that the company calculated that the ship would float upright with any two adjacent compartments flooded. Mr. Scanlon tried to make him admit that this supposition was wrong in view of what happened. However, it appealed that Peskett had no precise knowledge of what had happened and had not had either the opportunity or the inclination to find out. Although he had designed the Lusitania, he even refused to indicate the location of its boiler rooms. The shorthand transcript shows how he blocked Mr. Scanlon's inquiries. Scanlon, have you heard where she was struck by the torpedo or torpedoes? Peskett, unofficially I have. Numbers 3 and 4 boiler room were opened to the sea by the first torpedo. Scanlon, can you indicate on this plan of the ship those compartments which you understand to have been opened by the torpedo or torpedoes? Peskett, no, I cannot. I had nothing to do with this. I was ill at the time. I was away six months, so I cannot speak on the subject. Scanlon, have you read the petition which the Cunard Steamship Company has presented to the court in America? Peskett, no, I have not. Scanlon, with regard to the getting out of the boats, have you been informed of the vessel taking a heavy list? Peskett, as I have said before, I am not at all acquainted with the details of the loss of the ship. Scanlon, and it has not, I gather, been your business at all to make yourself acquainted with the circumstances which prevailed when the boats were being launched. Peskett, I have not done so. Scanlon managed to obtain an admission that, since the loss, gear davits had become compulsory on all passenger ships, but Peskett justified his use of what he described as old-fashioned davits as they were more reliable. His scientific calculations had indeed been upset, as Cunard's marine superintendent had confided to Consul Frost, but Peskett had obviously put his head in the sand and had no wish to enlighten himself. His evidence can only be described as unhelpful. 
Sir Alfred Booth, he had been made a baronet the previous January for his services to British shipping, also gave evidence. He too professed ignorance of what had happened. He claimed that he had not even read the transcript of the Mersey inquiry and had no idea what wireless messages or other instructions had been given to the captain. Scanlon drew his attention to the fact that when Cunard had presented their plea to the American courts, Sir Alfred had sworn an affidavit that the instructions and signals as disclosed before Lord Mersey were the only ones that had passed. He asked Sir Alfred how, if he was unaware of them, could he have made such a statement. Sir Alfred explained that he was assured by those in authority that this was so. Who by? asked Scanlon. The Admiralty, Booth replied, and explained that he had had a series of interviews but could not recall with whom he had spoken. So this is all very helpful and clear, isn't it? Uh, Scanlon expressed surprise that the chairman of Cunard could not give more specific answers to what were very simple questions. Sir Alfred lost his temper. I've received all kinds of notes and requests from the Admiralty and I can no more tell you what they are than fly. So it is no use asking me. You might as well drop it because I cannot answer you truthfully because I do not know. Under pressure from Scanlon, Booth admitted that there were other instructions but that he himself was unaware of their content. Commissioner Wynne, taking the evidence, intervened and asked him, Do I understand that these questions which are causing such difficulty refer to a state secret? You are correct, replied Sir Alfred. Captain Turner, despite his prior coaching, also conceded that there had been a further instruction and gave a clue as to what it had contained. Scanlon. So it sounds like they've all been told to shut up. Scanlon, may I take it that you have at present in your mind all the instructions that the Admiralty issued? Turner. Yes, pretty well. Scanlon. Those which are disclosed by your company and those which are not disclosed. Turner. It would be a task to tell you what instructions I have had from the Admiralty and everyone else. I could paper the walls with them. Scanlon. I'm talking about the instructions in this, he showed Turner, the published transcript of Lord Mersey's inquiry. With these three, you could not do much papering. Turner. Nope, that is right. Scanlon. I understand some other instructions were received from the Admiralty than those mentioned here. Turner, you are quite right. Scanlon, I call for those instructions. Turner, I'm afraid that you will have to call. Scanlon, do you refuse? Turner, yes, I refuse absolutely. All I can do is to respectfully refer you to the Admiralty. Scanlon, had you received before the ship sailed from New York on the 1st of May 1915, any Admiralty instructions in addition to those which you have disclosed in answer to Mr. Butler Aspinall. Turner, I cannot remember anything about them at all. Scanlon, were the other instructions, that is, the instructions which are not disclosed, advices from the Admiralty with reference to the navigation of the Lusitania? Turner, yes, they tell which course to take. Unbelievably, Scanlon, having established the existence and significance of the concealed message, did not follow up his advantage. Nor did he compare Turner's admission that, he w that the withheld instructions dealt with the navigation of the Lusitania with Sir William Graham Greene's letter, which was read to the court after Turner had stepped down. Its text deserves a second examination. I am to state, however, that the memorandum does in fact include all the instructions, advice and notices given to the Lusitania which are relevant to the issues raised as to the navigation of the vessel and further that it does include all the wireless messages which were sent by or on behalf of the Admiralty to and received by the master of the Lusitania. Apart from establishing that the Admiralty was withholding material evidence, the evidence taken in London for the American trial proved to be of little use to the claimants, Turner, Peskett and Sir Alfred all escaped the rigours of cross-examination by American attorneys who probably would not have been so accommodating uh, who probably would not have been so accommodating as Mr. Scanlon. Transcripts of the London hearings were forwarded to all the parties involved, and Cunard applied for a date to be set for the trial. Judge Julius B. Meyer scheduled the 24th of October 1917. The claimants cross-petitioned to have the trial delayed until after the war, on the grounds that it would then be in order to force the Admiralty to produce the withheld evidence. Meyer, after consulting with the Chief Justice, turned them down. Angered by his refusal, 
John M. Nolan of Messrs. Nolan, Friedland and Digby, attorneys for one of the claimants, asked Senator La Follette, an ardent pacifist and a powerful publisher, to lobby the Department of Justice. La Follette exceeded his brief. At that time, his twin platforms were pacifism and women's suffrage. On behalf of Nolan, he approached William Jennings Bryan for his background knowledge, and then Dudley Field Malone, who had publicly supported women's suffrage. His approach to Malone did not go unnoticed by Special Agent Bruce Bylaski, who reported the matter to the President. Wilson asked Secretary of the Treasury McAdoo to detail a private secretary to prepare a confidential report on Malone's conduct and attendance to his duties. The private secretary, W.B. Claggett, wrote personally to Wilson on the 7th of September that Malone was neglecting his duties and enclosed his attendance record which showed he was hardly ever in the office. The same day, Wilson asked for and obtained Malone's letter of resignation which drew attention to the work he had done over the Lusitania and announced that he intended to devote his life to the cause of women's suffrage as he was not content with the administration's attitude to it. A fortnight later, on the 20th of September, Senator La Follette made a speech at St. Paul, Missouri, which he devoted to the Lusitania and Lansing's doctrine that the presence of American citizens aboard a belligerent vessel should, be given, should, be, should give immunity. He claimed publicly, four days before the Lusitania sailed, President Wilson was warned in person by Secretary of State Bryan that the Lusitania had six million rounds of ammunition on board, besides explosives, and that the passengers who proposed to sail on that vessel were sailing in violation of statute of this country. He went on to explain the spirit of the Passenger Act of 1882 and continued, Secretary Bryan appealed to President Wilson to stop passengers from sailing on the Lusitania. I am giving you some history that probably has not been given you here before. The speech, which was widely reported, drew an angry response from the Senate, which formed a committee to demand La Follette's expulsion. If the motion had been debated, a great many issues, which remained unresolved for many years, would have been exposed. To prepare his defence before the Senate, La Follette demanded the full manifest of the Lusitania, together with copies of Malone's report and all of the relevant information which the Treasury might hold. The Treasury referred him to Lansing, who replied that th these documents had been transferred to the archives as they were secret documents. Malone then wrote to Lansing and the chairman of the Senate committee, offering to testify in La Follette's defence. Lansing had to act quickly. The Senate dropped their expulsion demand, Malone kept his silence and Judge Meyer adjourned the Cunard Company's petition until the following law term. La Follette had achieved a six-month delay for John Nolan. Unfortunately for the claimants, peace was still a year away. Judge Meyer convening the hearing on the 7th of April 1918. Judge Meyer convened the hearing on the 7th of April 1918. It was a sterile and barely reported affair, despite the multiplicity of lawyers and the emotional issues involved. America had been at war for a year, and tempers and attitudes had changed when the casualty lists began to come in. Before any evidence was taken, all allegations referring to contraband munitions, troops or guns were dropped. Judge Meyer expressed his pleasure by remarking, Good, now that story is forever disposed of. New evidence relating to the stability of the ship was given, but on the orders of the Secretary of the Navy, it was given in camera, and no reference to the sitting was allowed in the court notices, the law journal, or the daily calendar of cases. Basically, it confirmed the inherent instability of the vessel, and revealed that every American passenger ship with side bunkers was being or had been converted to a transverse system of bulkheads to avoid a repetition of the disaster. On the 23rd of August 1918, Judge Meyer found for Cunard on the grounds that the action of the U-20 was an illegal act according to the American interpretation of international law. From this premise, he descended to the American case law that, where the direct cause of an accident was by an illegal act, there could be no negligence unless the owners and master of the vessel were privy to the U-20's action. As no evidence had been offered to him alleging such privity, Cunard was entitled to the judgment. Judicially, Meyer's decision was as sound as it was convenient. 
He disposed of the in-camera evidence by noting that as an illegal act had caused the disaster, he did not propose to examine, examine the several interesting arguments that had been presented to him. There were no appeals against the decision. The claimants met their own costs, and the net value of the wreck strippings totaling £147, 16 shillings and 8 uh, D, I don't even know what a D stands for, was shared amongst them. Lord Day and Lord Fees totaled $77,695.19. In the light of the American decision, Cunard settled all other claims out of court by paying the claimant's legal costs. <clears throat> there was one small piece of evidence which had not been ten tendered before Judge Meyer for the simple reason that President Wilson still had it in his office. This was the Lusitania's original manifest, together with the 24-page supplementary one which Dudley Field Malone had handed to him. The President sealed the papers in an envelope, marked it only to be opened by the President of the United States, and consigned it to the Treasury Archives, where it remained as secure from prying eyes as the Lusitania herself, 320 feet down and 12 miles south at the old head of Kinsale. Captain Turner returned to the sea, being torpedoed again when in command of the Link 30 miles west of Cyprus in 1917. What are the odds of being torpedoed twice? He survived, and after the war, Cunard promoted him Commodore of the Line. In 1921, Churchill published The World Crisis, which contained an account of the Lusitania disaster, which can only be described as a more elegantly written version of Captain Webb's me memorandum. The World Crisis is now recognised as a four-volume exercise in self-justification, most aptly described by Lytton Strachey when he remarked to Maynard Keynes, Winston has written a four-volume book about himself and called it The World Crisis. The account, given wide currency at the time, inaccurately exposed Turner of, as having been responsible for the disaster. He retired, unable to face the public and hostile criticism of the Liverpool shipping world. He built himself a cottage at Yelverton in Devonshire and took up beekeeping, but again he was located by the press, so he went to Australia for 18 months to search for the sons whom he had not seen since the opening of the Mersey Inquiry. The search was unsuccessful. Eventually, unable to resist the lure of Liverpool, he retired there to spend the last few years of his life with Miss Every looking after him. He became a great favourite with the local children, teaching them sea shanties and accompanying them on a fiddle. He died of cancer of the intestines in 1933, being bedridden for the last five years of his life and remarking to visitors with bitter humour, I am all right fore and aft, but my longitudinal bulkhead's given way. Admiral Sir Charles Coke was ordered to hold down his flag at Queenstown on the 27th of May 1915 and transferred to the reserve. Six months later, he was re-employed as a temporary captain in charge of troop shipments from Halifax, Nova Scotia, a rank and mission which a former keeper of the Royal's room at the Admiralty Archives remarks might possibly be taken as a mark of their lordship's displeasure. Admiral Hood was promoted on the 13th of May 1915 to the commander of the 3rd Battle Cruiser Squadron and was killed in action at Jutland. Captains Hall and Gaunt each rose to be rear admirals and were knighted. Captain Lieutenant Schweiger was drowned in the U-88 on the 17th September 1917, whilst Admiral Sir Frederick Inglefield died in his bed, as did Sir Alfred Booth and Lord Mersey, who had accepted a viscountcy in November 1915. William Jennings Bryan stayed in the political wilderness, briefly appearing in the public eye at the notorious monkey trial in March 20, 1925, when he defended the local belief that evolution was an improper subject and should not be taught in school. Which is absolutely correct about, in my opinion. Robert Lansing was dismissed by President Wilson after the Versailles Peace Conference. He published his war memoirs in 1926 and then retired to fish bass at Henderson Harbour and play mentor to his favourite nephew, John Foster Dulles. Alfred Fraser remained a picturesque operator on the fringe of the sheepskin market 
and is remembered to this day with many a rueful shudder amongst the fur-dealing community. Dr. Ritter von Retteg vanished into an anonymous limbo after his, elite, uh, after his release from the Cleveland Penitentiary, while von Papen, after becoming Chancellor of Germany, closed his career as German ambassador to Turkey in the last war from which position he mounted some remarkably sophisticated intelligence operations. Churchill went to France in command of the 6th Battalion Royal Scots Fusiliers, and it was not until 1939 that he returned as First Lord of the Admiralty. The famous signal was flashed out to the fleet, Winston is back. More discreet was his first memorandum to the Trade Department on the 7th of September 1939. Report the names of British passenger ships which, if sunk, would cause national despondency. The Trade Division replied, naming the Lusitania's sister ship the Mauritania and the Queen Mary. Both were promptly dispatched to New York until they were required for trooping duties. By January 1940, Britain and America stood in a relationship almost identical to that of May 1915. On the 21st of January, President Franklin Roosevelt asked Edwin M. Watson, one of his secretaries, to bring him President Wilson's packet from the Treasury Archives, the then Collector of Customs, Harry M. Durning, searched it out and handed it over. Watson sent it through to the President with the following note. The White House, Washington, 1st 26th January 1940. Memorandum for the President. This is from Mr. Durning and is the original manifest of the SS Lusitania. He wanted me to open it, but I was afraid to do it until you had seen it. I have thanked Mr. Durning. And that is the end of Lusitania by Colin Simpson. It would be interesting to go through the acknowledgements, I think. Uh... Looks like journals. It seems like he's working with a lot of people, journals and uh, newspaper editors. Philip Knightley, I recognize that name. I've got a book of his. Uh, someone from the Sunday Times as well. But yeah. Oh, hang on. Sorry, I just messed up my audio there, didn't I? Okay. I don't know how long uh, I was quiet for there. Hopefully not too long. I was just saying that it's very revelatory. And gives you a good insight and glimpse into how the game is played at, at a much higher level where these governments have the power to lock up information from the public because of... Uh, security and for your safety and we need to protect you by uh making sure you you don't know that we're lying and manipulating and uh concocting all these events and spinning a narrative that is convenient for us to tell you but you will never know the truth because we're gonna stamp it secret and lock it away for 50 years so I enjoyed that very much, but uh, what do you think? Did you have any comments or uh, insights or feedback? Let's have a quick look at the chat. Yeah, Peter's talk. So we're to that um, topic of liability, Peter is saying they give farmers blanket immunity, which is an ironic turn of phrase. And it is, yeah, immunity. Absolutely true. Peter's saying, uh, I think I posted the wrong link. Uh, Okay. Saying there's a name there's a name that now means traitor, which is one of the northern countries in World War Two. Or northern countries. Uh Adamski says page two hundred and fifty four D is for a pence in old money. Oh, right. Well that makes sense. <laughs> I guess a D and a P kind of look similar. But thank you for that. That's a new thing that I learned today. It reminds me as well that uh, last week or the week before I learned that there used to be, I don't know, over, there used to be some random number of pence in a, in a pound. Is it 244 or something like that? There used to be 244 pence in a pound. My dad and his friend were telling me about that down the pub. 
there used to be 244D in a pound. I guess you can't have P for pound and P for pence as well, right? So that's probably why they've got D for pence. But uh, yeah, well, anyway, we've done Lusitania. And uh, I think I'm really glad that we, we got through that one, actually. It was it was kind of uh, quite a roller coaster. The, the, the court transcripts and that whole part of it, I found pretty dry and hard to follow because I think um, reading them through like that, it's hard to get a sense of who's... The way they speak to each other as well, that very formal kind of way of speaking back then, it, it, it's hard to read into it and read the nuance and the things that they're implying because, you know, the British way of speaking is always to t talk around things and not say things too directly and, and um, be more subtle in the way you communicate and leave things out and imply things. And so those, to me, those sections were kind of tough to to follow along with and to really get the nuance of who was misleading and who was being honest and who was in on the scheme and who'd been, but it was, but it's obviously clear that there had been orders from the top to get this thing shut down and not say anything and um, not aid any of the people who want the truth uh, and wanted to get to the bottom of the truth. So a very clear, uh, I think, and strong case for just a cover up, um, which they will always argue is done in the in the in uh, because of national security and it's to save you and protect you, of course, uh, and because uh, we have to lie to you, it's for your own good. <laughs> so just shut up and stop asking questions, you, know, you and your pesky questions. Yeah, good stuff though. Um, I think I have. I'm, and I've got one more book by Colin Simpson, which uh, I'm looking forward to reading at some point. That's all about uh, Lawrence of Arabia. And it's called The Secret Lives of Lawrence of Arabia. So that will be a good one to look at too. But that's definitely... And the other thing I really enjoyed about this this book as well, thinking about it now, is how how that narrative... Like how I was already familiar with people people's name, like Colonel House... President Wilson, um, Churchill, these these uh, J.P. Morgan. I already had a, some some knowledge of these players, so that's a really nice puzzle piece to kind of fit into that. Good to know as well that um, Churchill's memoirs gloss over and don't give any justice to the the truth of this incident. Um, I think that's not a surprise. <laughs> But that, but that kind of information makes me want to get copies of, of those books because then I feel like I've got a hard copy of this bit of nonsense propaganda that this supposed national hero has put out. <laughs> but apparently as well, in, in his, uh, he's got a, I think he's got a five or six volume account of the Second World War. And apparently that, that's, that uh, whole series of books has no mention of gas chambers in it anywhere which is very surprising to me now i haven't backed that up by reading them and i haven't checked but somebody said that and i thought that is wild if it's true churchill churchill's account of the second world war has no mention apparently allegedly of gas chambers so pretty curious curiouser and curiouser as the saying goes so that is uh, i think we'll wrap it up there thank you very much uh, one more thing, I suppose, though. What's going to be next on Hayes Reviews? I'll give you a little sneak peek because it is right here. So this is a I put a I put a little poll out to my Telegram group, and I, I picked a few books. I'll check that the uh, the vote hasn't massively changed since I last looked at it. No, it hasn't. We've had nine votes, and the story of the Rockefeller Foundation by Raymond Fosdick has come out on top. So this is what we're going to be diving into next. Why is the Rockefeller Foundation significant? Well, they had a huge hand to play in the formation of the current medical paradigm that we're living in, the allopathic med mod um, model of medicine. As well as that, they had a huge influence on education in America and elsewhere. This is the story of the Rockefeller Foundation in the words of the guy who, who ran it. Raymond B. Fosdick, he was, as it tells us here, I think, yeah, he was, he was, let's see, I think he was the president. 
but uh, since yeah, since nineteen nineteen, I think I think he was the president of the uh, founda- of the Rockefeller Foundation, and so the the Rockefellers kind of their name their name gets thrown around all the time in the truth community, in the um, research community, the the kind of people who are interested questioning the mainstream narrative and becoming familiar with actual real history. You're always hearing about the Rockefellers and John D. Rockefeller. And so I thought this would be a good book to add to my collection because it is a, an oldie. Uh, let's have a little quick peek in here. Yeah, there we go. 1952. 1952, this came out. And that's the first printing. I think it's a British printer. There is uh, J.D. Rockefeller Sr. himself. Look at that chap. You can just tell by his face that he is a philanthropist, can't you? (laughs) So keep an eye out for that. Uh, I've been negotiating with my wife as well, and I think we're going to go for two nights a week, two nights reading a week, because I've got a lot of other stuff going on as well. So it's going to be either Wednesday and Friday. Um, I might just stick with Wednesdays and Fridays. So I'll be back next week. Uh, You can always check on the Instagram and the Telegram where I'll announce uh, and let people know. But uh, let's sign off for now and wrap this up. Two hours, 16. Thank you very much for being here. uh, And I appreciate it. Um, There's not much more to say, really. We've done four books now, isn't it? We've we've done four books. So we're doing pretty well. And uh, we we got a lot of interesting historical information on the record that Uh, is going to be useful for people in the future to come back to and enjoy and learn from. So I feel good about what we're doing here. And I thank you very much for joining and taking part, writing in the comments. And uh, it's wonderful. So this, uh, tune in, keep an eye out for Rockefeller. We might start, probably we'll start on this next Wednesday. So pencil that in. Uh, Thank you very much for being here. Take care of yourselves and each other. Till next time, God bless.